now i'm a pharmacist they have their place they have their place i'm the expert with pharmaceuticals and they in in the right use uh, they absolutely can be life-saving i'm not against drugs but i am against people needing them you are listening to the dr haley show the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your health Each episode, there will be an interview or a message to help you discover better health. We will be featuring health radicals on the show to bring new ideas to the table, as well as doubling down on key fundamentals to support you living your best life. Your host is no other than the founder of Haley Nutrition, Dr. Michael Haley. Today's guest is Dr. Kathy Campbell, a pharmacist and author of Obesity, the Modern Famine, which is based on her popular TEDx talk. Dr. Kathy, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I've been digging into your book already quite a bit. I love it. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. My expectations. Um, And especially because I didn't know what I was going to get. I'm realizing, wait a second, this is a pharmacist which means you have a lot of training in medicine and yet you are helping people by teaching them what real food is <laughs> yeah yeah well and what people don't realize is we have a lot of training in chemistry and metabolic function and we manipulate it we're trained to manipulate it with pharmaceuticals and i've been a practicing pharmacist for 32 years in one town so i have four generations that i have had the great privilege to actually serve I didn't want him to be sick. And I was very clear that the medications we were giving him weren't having them reach the kind of health that I wanted. So I started looking deeper into those metabolic processes. And people don't realize drugs are only approved as an adjunct to diet and exercise. And so instead of just looking at pharmacology, I look at food pharmacology, pharmacology, And the hardest one, believe it or not, and you'll appreciate this, is stress pharmacology. And so I am going deeper into those metabolic systems and then trying to at least give them good foundational function. And the way to get those chemicals is whole food. That's how we evolved. And so I'm teaching not only my patients to do that, but I'm trying to communicate that to my profession as well. And that's what I love about the discussion that we're having right now, because uh, this is not going to be anything new to my audience, but it will be presented from a different perspective with new terminology, which is going to open up even more understanding to them and help them know all the more why they should be seeking out real foods. And it's Mm -hmm. funny because even in your book, I remember reading a sentence and it said foods with quotation marks around it, which... A lot of people don't understand the things that we perceive as food isn't really food, hence the quotation marks. Yes. Yeah. I I call them food-like substances. And we've actually been groomed by Wall Street to accept these chemical experiments that taste good and are packaged and are shelf-stable. We've been groomed to think that that's really what humans eat. And a shift really happened in the 80s. But like I said in the book, the big shift started when we went from hunting and gathering to agriculture. That's when we started narrowing the spectrum of chemistries coming in our body. That was about 14,000 years ago. But in the 80s, what really happened is, one, the Chrysler minivan. So we now had a structure for eating on the go. That was the first vehicle designed to eat in. But then those children of the 80s were started to be marketed as a kid's meal. You and I did not grow up with kid's meals. We we grew up with a protein starch and a vegetable, and that's what our parents had. We might have had a smaller portion, but there was never this specific kid's meal, which there is today. Nuggets and fries, pizza, mac and cheese, hamburgers. And then the adults of that generation, that's what they think humans eat. And so that grooming and that shift, I think has been catastrophic. Yeah, we're from the same generation. I was born in the late 60s. And Mm -hmm. in the 70s, we actually had milk delivered to our door. The milk truck would come around. And if you didn't use it up in a certain 
point in time, it would, it would spoil, uh, which we know that, well, that could have been infused with good bacteria and actually turned into a superfood. <laughs> yeah. But it made even better. But it's funny how things have changed. You are right. In the 80s, this ultra processing, that was also a big shift from the genetically modified corn, which is making its own pesticide and herbicide resistant. They had so much corn funded by the government, we had to find something to do with it. And they started making high fructose corn syrup out of all the excess corn that the government was funding. And all of a sudden we have new recipes in our Coca-Cola and, and things are changing. We're being put on all these high sugar diets. Well, one other thing you may not seen in some of the literature is with the Castro issue in the 60s, all of a sudden access to sugar cane shifted. So there was also a economic demand for a different kind of sweetener that occurred. And that's really where some of the development of the high fructose corn syrup came. But then the subsidies on corn, the farm embargoes and all that stuff, that was a massive time of industrial and economic shift. And of course, make more food. And then you look at the metabolism of fructose. One of the things that's unique to that chemical fructose is that when you eat it, it increases hunger. So you actually, in how it's metabolized, you actually want more. It doesn't happen with glucose, but with fructose, there is actually a dip in ATP that drives the animal to try to eat as much of it as possible. Well, that's a recipe for obesity. <laughs> it really yeah. is. Yeah. So. And give us a brief summary of what ATP is. Oh, yeah. ATP is the battery pack of life. It's called adenosine triphosphate. And our bodies... If you look at it, it's a little chunk of DNA called natinine. It's a little sugar called a ribose. And then it's three battery packs, which are called three high phosphate bonds. And they're really high energy, so they're hard to break apart. But our body uses that energy to actually think and beat your heart. And we actually have to utilize, we use our body weight in that little molecule every day. And so if you don't make enough of these battery packs, you don't have life. And it's an exquisite, you know, I say we have cellular factories and those are called mitochondria. And every fourth grader learns that the mitochondria is the power pack to the cell. And so you've got to have a cell that has healthy and happy mitochondria. And then those mitochondria within them, they have assembly lines. And so these assembly lines have just like a Ford factory, nuts and bolts and tires and all these minerals, because you've got to go through these chemical reactions to take glucose or some other macro down the assembly line to make this critical molecule that is energy. And the exquisite, beautiful system that this is, if it's working well, you can take $1 of glucose and compound it down that assembly line to an impressive $38 of energy. And that's amazing. Except here's what I'm seeing. Nobody has enough nuts and bolts and tires. So these assembly line components are your B vitamins and your minerals and your cytochromes. You've got these chemical reactions, and if they're not enough of the nuts and bolts and tires, so instead of 38, you might only make $10 of this energy. Well, that's a crisis for the cell. Yeah. And so the cell sends a message to the behavior organ, which is the brain, and says, you need to shut her down. You need to make her grumpy. You need to slow her metabolic burn and lower her temperature because we've only got $10 down here. We got to keep her breathing and warm. And so I think when I've looked at this for my patients, that's where I start helping them is at that foundational energy production. And it's relatively complex, but the cure is relatively simple. It's not easy. But it is those whole food components and make optimizing the body's utilization of those nuts and bolts and tires on the assembly line. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's kind of like, I guess, if Henry Ford was putting his assembly line together and getting the parts from the junkyard, 
Mm-hmm. He's only going to turn out so many good automobiles. Right. Right. I mean, I even often use the metaphor of cooking. Let's try to bake a cake with half the ingredients. Right. You're going to get something, but it's not going to be optimal. Or you can cut the recipe in half and you might get half size, you see. So the body adjusts magnificently. I mean, I'm always in awe of the beauty and the magnificence of our machine. Right. And it's complexity. And unfortunately, with complexity, um, it's hard to scale complexity. So medicine, we like to make it as simple as possible. Here's a pill. And it's just... It's not, it's so complex. The actual cure is actually what you're talking about, which is relatively straightforward, which is eat seven to 10 cups of vegetables, nice protein, make sure your gut's able to absorb them, chew them. All these things are relatively simple, but they're increasingly difficult given our culture. Right. So. Yeah, we're going to dig into that gut stuff in a little bit. I want to know though, at what point did this become important to you? And how did you end up in pharmacology? Pharmacy, you know, you know, when you're young, you know, I'm in my 20s or my 18 and I'm going to school. I really like science, really like science. I like thinking that way. But I also liked taking care of people. I was really good at customer service. I mowed lawns. I did all that stuff as a kid. And so when I went to college, I knew I was going to get some degree in either. My mom suggested pharmacy. I thought, well, that sounds like something to explore pharmacy or medicine. And I just went along that line and my penchant for science really worked in that field. I also had had a lifetime study of obesity myself. So 1972, I'm a five-year-old that weighs a hundred pounds. There weren't very many of us at five years old that weighed a hundred pounds. I was part of a morbidly obese family that was multiple generations of morbid obesity. I had a 350 pound grandfather in the Great Depression. So, and I worked at it, we all worked at it. We were healthy, but we were obese. I knew over my life of studying this that food was not the only piece of the puzzle. Because the guy next to me is eating six times more than I am and I'm still holding on to weight. It didn't make sense. And I also knew I was really fortunate to be big in a big family that I didn't suffer from the psychological shame of it. So I could be somewhat objective. So you marry that insight and that practice with three degrees in basic science. And it's interesting, my first degree was zoology. And so I had a lot of comparative anatomy, a lot of evolutional science, which really informed me when I was digging in to, all right, what? should we be eating? Where did things go awry? And what should I be recommending to my patients? So that personal journey led me to one, go ahead and get pharmacy because it's a fantastic place to serve people. I'm a community pharmacist and I get to solve problems every day for them. And what I'm solving for today is longevity. It's proactive health. I want my patients to have a rock in life for as long as they want at any stage. So if I have someone with stage four cancer, I want them to have a great life. And so to be a community pharmacist, I am an anchor to support people's health and well-being. And it's been a perfect place to do that. I don't know if that answers that. I mean, there's a lot of challenges in our current healthcare system, and there's definitely that within pharmacy right now as well. Yeah, it answers it. And you also kind of revealed who you are in that when you were talking about you want them to have a beautiful life. I heard you say on your TEDx talk that my life is no better. My life is great. It was great before. Yeah. But life is a lot easier not carrying around 150 extra pounds. Yeah. Your outlook, your life is a joyful life. And now it's easier. How do you get better than great already? <laughs> well, you contribute more. Yeah. You, you dream more. You experience more. And you have the energy to do that, right? You don't have to worry about a seat extender when you get on the plane. 
your feet don't hurt as much. So carrying around 150 pounds has its own burden and challenge. And I always say obesity is a symptom. It's not the problem. It's incredibly problematic, right? Mm -hmm. It's not good for the knees. It can have its own hormonal dysfunction. I get that. But until we start seeing it as a symptom of these other lying drivers, I don't think it's going to be fully recognized for what it really is, which is a symptom of the body's survival. Yeah, it's interesting because some people probably think they're victims because they have slow metabolisms. How and when is that actually an asset? Oh, my gosh. Whenever there's no food around. I mean, (laughs) when there's an actual famine, having that genetics can be phenomenal. But what we know about genetics is they're exquisitely adaptable to the environment, right? So if we change, this is the beauty of it. And this is the dials I help my patients grab onto. The environment will change your genetics. And so if we can craft an environment or what I call a culture that produces a different outcome, and that's what I have people assess is, all right, what's going on in your life that's really having your body respond this way? And it's rarely a deficiency in a drug. (laughs) It's rarely a deficiency in a drug. If anything, and like I say in the book, there's some fundamental chemistries that we are completely lacking. And the whole book is looking at those. We don't eat enough of the right stuff. We don't move enough. I think there's a fundamental deficiency in plant and movement and love and connection. And so I talk about all that. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about gut health and where things are going wrong with the food, the chemistry that we're eating. And when we're talking about the chemistry we're eating, obviously, you mentioned it in your book, the the pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, the chemicals that are going into the food, which are forms of antibiotics. Of course, you've talked about antibiotics also, but these chemicals in the food are antibiotics, even preservatives are against life. They are there to kill. And you talked about consuming these things and essentially feeding them to our microbes, right? our gut. How does that work? Are you enjoying the show thus far? One of the many health secrets that we have covered on the show is all around aloe vera, specifically drinking raw aloe vera, Our aloe vera has helped our customers effectively heal their gut, increase their intestine health, lower inflammation in the body, eliminate and or decrease acid reflux, have glowing skin and hair, and so much more. Now, as a frequent member of our audience, you will be exposed to exclusive specials and coupon codes for the awesome products manufactured by Haley Nutrition. That's right, for simply being awesome and tuning in, you can get a mini discount to help you optimize and better your health. To see how we can help and support you on your health journey, tune into the episodes and listen for coupon codes that you can use at www.haleynutrition.com before you make your orders of raw aloe vera. Once again, it's www.haleynutrition.com. Now, back to the show. Well, the toxins that we are consuming, and I include pharmaceuticals, I consume actually most of life, even if it's natural toxins like hemlock or any of those things. I mean, they're intuitive to they, they disrupt the optimal biologic function. When that for years, we were told that some of the pesticides and the glyphosate didn't hurt humans, right? Well, except that the bacteria in our gut actually create a huge proportion of the critical chemistries that our bodies need to function. And they function a lot like the plant. So when we are killing the plant and we put this into our gut, we are literally dismantling our chemistry microbiome factory. And so that's part of it. And then we've got impacts on digestion. Just as benign as a Benadryl and an anticholinergic antihistamine alters acid production in the gut. But nobody's telling you this, right? And so pharmaceuticals in the 40s, there was a strategic marketing that health was in the pill bottle and at the doctor's office. And in reality, we don't know that. And actually, it's nothing farther could be from the truth. But that's what the society was groomed to think from a marketing and business standpoint. 
And most drugs are not fully vetted generations out. So that's of real concern to me as well. The drugs currently are vetted for the individual. Is it hurting or helping the patient that's consuming it? But we don't know what happens to the second or third generation. So these chemicals are increasingly disruptive to optimal function. Now, I'm a pharmacist. They have their place. They have their place. I'm the expert with pharmaceuticals. And in in the right use, uh, they absolutely can be life-saving. I'm not against drugs, but I am against people needing them. Mm -hmm. And so I try to really create the conditions to delay the onset of disease or delay the progression. And if I have somebody who needs hypertensive medicine, I'm going to optimize that, minimize any negatives. And I'm going to do that with diet, exercise, and every other component that I can so that they don't have a stroke and need those medicines, right? So it really is in a proactive health model. It's trying to really address the drivers of these conditions and not just wait till we can have a diagnosis and go to the doctor and take a pill. And I see that at every stage. Yeah, yeah. As we talk about the microbiology, I like to explain that when you eat, you're actually feeding them, not you. Are we hosting the microbiome or are they hosting us? They're hosting us. (laughs) They're hosting us. I mean, and I ask that question to my patients when I communicate this. I said, they are hosting us because when they're not happy, we're not healthy. And so I think it's really important for us to start relating to what goes in our mouth as feeding them. And we can see that with all the butyrates and the short chain fatty acids and the fact that these bacteria love fiber. They love fiber. And if they don't have fiber, they start consuming you, right? They start degrading that protective lining in the gut. So they need really good stuff to eat. And it's it's not diet soda. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not that. That actually hurts them. And so, yeah, it's exactly it. They're you know, hosting it, us for sure. I, I like the way you put that. Uh, what's the difference between feeding them fiber and feeding them sugar? Well, I always say that the sugar feeds the bullies and the bad guys and the fiber feeds the good guys. And, you know, there's so many ways to approach what is an optimal diet. And I have been studying it for 50 years personally. And it's everybody's very unique because different genetics may be more prone to having different things that work better. Uh, But when you look at the different diets, what was interesting about some of the research is that you live longer eating beans, eating whole grains, you just live longer. And so to me, if my game and my outcome is a long and healthy life, I had to look at that blue zone research, Mediterranean research. But what was interesting about potato and tubers is that the good beneficial bacteria thrive when that is present. So this whole thing of never having a potato, first of all, I don't think that's a life worth living, but the the bacteria, the good guys love it and they thrive. Now, again, there's different, it's balance in this and it's not an all potato diet. It's not an all spinach diet. Our bodies evolved with this cornucopia of chemical selection based on the seasons, right? And so I think the body needs a representative of all these magnificent nutrients. And they've identified over 26,000 different chemicals in foods. Which one's doing it? I don't know that we can even figure that out. But I do know the more variety I give the body in whole, I'm not a fan of even once you dehydrate, once you do start changing the whole food, some of these chemicals are so ephemeral, they disappear. And so that's to me why it's so important to get that baseline bucket of nutrients every day into the body to give the body a chance at having what it needs. Yeah, I think it's amazing that we have a, list of 20 some vitamins with their recommended dietary intake. But as you wrote in your book about garlic having, I believe it was over 2300 chemical compounds in it. Okay, well, how much are we supposed to get of all of those? 
We're not going to get it in a vitamin bottle unless they're full of concentrated foods, <laughs> dehydrated food sources. And even then that changes it. So I'm with you. I mean, I think I tell my patients, we have to get the food as right as possible. That's the first step just to try to replicate. And again, we've been groomed to think that health is in a pill and it's, and that extrapolates into the supplements as well. I mean, I supplement and I supplement responsibly as a pharmacist, anything going in my patient, I'm critically responsible for. And it's not that I don't use that, but I, I don't, I try to really impart on this. This doesn't get close to what food can do. Um, we've got to work on that. And when I help people do that, they get it because their function improves a bunch. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, in one of her books, she was talking about soil and how the soil is dead. So now farmers need to add nutrients to it in the form of fertilizers. But if things were in their natural and the farmlands were not covered with pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, killing the microbiology in the soil, then they would be turning the things over and fungus would grow on trees that fell down and amoeba and bacteria would be consuming and worms are in there and they're pooping and the animals are eating the stuff that grows out of the ground and they're pooping and they're making the soil. Now, healthy soil. We are doing that inside our guts. Our microbiome is turning what we have prepared by chewing it all up and working some of the enzymes into it. We swallow it and it goes down into this acid bath to get somewhat sterilized and then pushed on where the enzymes continue to work on it and the microbiology goes to work making soil so that just like in the farmlands where the roots of the plants are sinking into the soil, the roots of our intestines can sink into the soil that we make through that digestive process that involves the microbiology making the soil. And it's such a perfect parallel because we could spray the farmlands and kill everything, killing the soil, or we can eat those things, killing our soil. Mm -hmm. And now we need fertilizer. We need supplements. Or we can continue to seek out real food, real nutrition, so that our bodies have what it needs, not killing it off. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, that's a beautiful explanation of what we need and, and how we've messed it up <laughs> and yeah. how it's multifactorial. And it can be a little overwhelming for the patient if you really dig into that. But I, what to do isn't as important as how to figure out how to do it. And so that's where I coach people to get back to those basics. And they often will say, well, what about the quality of the vegetable? Or I said, what? Do what you can. Do what you can where you can. And if that's a canned green bean, okay, that's better than something else. Right. Now, could you grow it if you want extra points? Yeah, let's let's grow some things. I've got a little uh, planter box out in front of my pharmacy, and we grow vegetables this time of year and and herbs and and I do that to really reinforce for my patients the value of these chemistries, these food chemistries. But again, do good, better, best. And what we find is when that starts interrupting like this ultra processed food or start getting more of those nutrients in, there is a direct improvement in function that the patient sees. And then they begin to correlate those actions to, oh, this is how I should feel normal. I think we're so separate from what normal or optimal is anymore. We don't even know what optimal function looks like because we're so conditioned to poor function, right? I've seen what happens when you give young kids in school and Sunday class crap snacks, mm -hmm. and then they get crazy. Mm -hmm. When the food is making you cuckoo, have a low mood, 
be irritable or depressed. It's not real food. Right. Let's talk about the pH because part of that digestive issue is the acidity in your stomach. And it's important. And a lot of people are having heartburn, acid reflux. What's going wrong? When do antacids have their place? And what should people be doing about it? So we're supposed to have a bowl full of acid, a battery acid in the middle of our stomach. I mean, in the middle of our body. And the, that, that role for that battery acid is really important. First of all, it does kill pathogens on the first path, right? But our body is also exquisitely prepared for that battery acid in an optimal system. Now, rocks come into our body. Minerals come into our body. Magnesium, iron, the, zinc, these are rocks. And they have to be bathed in an acid bath for them to turn into a form that can be absorbed later. So I think for me, one of the most primary reasons you need acid is to start transforming the food into the basic building blocks of life. Protein has to be bathed in acid to start being cleaved into its universal or its it's pieces of amino acids so that the body can absorb amino acids, take them, utilize and rebuild you and repair you and create all these, these functioning chemicals that you need, like DNA, those little things like that, proteins. So acid is, it's not the first step in digestion. Actually thinking about food and finding food is part of that digestive process. Chopping food, cooking food, all the time you're doing that, your body is preparing the acid bath. It's preparing the enzymes. It's salivating. You're starting this whole process. And so acid is critical for preparing chemicals to be absorbed for utilization. We've messed that up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even just a lot of people will have acid reflux. And it's often because the muscular gate at the top of the stomach, at the lower part of the really fragile, unprotected esophagus, that gate has to be really tight. It's a tight muscle. But if it's loose, the acid will sneak up and cause a lot of the reflux that we're seeing. Well, what causes loose gates? No magnesium, no minerals that actually help that muscle contract. So it's this vicious cycle of let's assume you even take in magnesium, you don't have the acid to fully absorb it, and then you become deficient at the cellular level. You, it's this vicious, vicious circle. Yeah. Then you look at our cultural diet, and there are things that directly loosen up that gate. And so it is painful to have acid burning your esophagus. I get that. But that is, again, symptomatic of some underlying things that if we address and not just turn off the acid, which is the pharmaceuticals approach, um, which we know now is catastrophically bad for longevity, especially the one class called the proton pump inhibitors. Um, if we just turn it off, then we end up with some massive cellular starvation, I think, because you don't get those minerals and you're not absorbing optimally protein. And that's even assuming if they're coming in the diet. So your ability to even fully utilize those things is compromised. So acid is critical for optimal function. I'm Dr. Michael Haley, interrupting this podcast to let you know we have a special at Haley Nutrition today and a site-wide coupon. If you head over to the shop, you'll see that while supplies last, we only have a limited number of these battery-powered mixers, you can get one free with your single can purchase of iogreens, vegetable, and fruit powder. Lately, I've been using mine every day to make my greens, and I also like to froth up my organic cold coffee mixed in coconut milk with Haley Vegan Protein, my morning treat. And you probably know we rarely discount our raw frozen aloe vera because the profit margin is a little rough in the frozen food industry. But to thank you for tuning in to the Dr. Haley Show podcast throughout the month of May 2024, use the coupon code JUICE, 
J-U-I-C-E, to get 5% off your entire purchase, including our specials and including our famous raw frozen aloe vera gel health drink. All right, let me let you get back to the podcast. Yeah. One of my main products uh, in Haley Nutrition is aloe vera, and people are actually using that so they don't need to take their proton pump inhibitors. Mm-hmm. I have no idea how it works, <laughs> but I know people are getting great results. When it comes to the acid reflux, I like to suggest before medications, there are things you can try. Chew your food better. Get those enzymes worked into it. One of the best demonstrations I've ever seen was from Dr. Andrea Hazim about 20 years ago. In this class that I attended, she made a bowl of oatmeal and she opened up some fruit and vegetable powdered capsules and that had digestive enzymes in them, sprinkled it on the oatmeal and we watched it liquefy, which was a great demonstration on how amylase will chemically affect the food, breaking down the starches and other enzymes. Yeah. Yeah. And understanding that when we eat, we're processing the food, we're working the enzymes into the food with our teeth. We want to consume foods that have enzymes in them. I know aloe vera has a lot of enzymes in it. That might be one of the ways it works. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. But consuming those enzyme rich foods, chewing it up, Probably having smaller meals, especially before bed, when you're about to change gravitational positions and where that full belly might be affecting that that esophageal sphincter. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And and we have these circadian rhythms with acid production, and that makes a difference too. You have a lot of acid produced in the middle of the night. And so if you have a low sphincter tone because of mineral deficiency or or maybe even a hiatal hernia, a structural issue, you might wake up and go, wow. And there, and that's where we may be able to, we may need to do some things because with structural changes, I often will send them to a chiropractor to make sure that we can't manipulate that back into place. Or sometimes even a surgical repair might actually in the long term be a better strategy than taking some of these medications that just turn off your acid forever. Because we know that some of the complete acid turnoff, which is what happens in some of these category of drugs, long-term aging just accelerates. And that's where you get the dementia and osteoporosis and these diseases of deficiencies, I call them, because the the cells, cells just don't have what it takes to recover and repair. So yeah, I think we've got to pull in more strategies than just I mean, we've got way too much information to just be believing that it's that pill that will fix it. And we have to take that on as our own being a consumer and managing our own well-being. Yeah, I want to bring this full circle with everything we've talked about up to this point. Digestion, the microbiome, things not going quite right causing eventually this inflammatory bowel condition, which up here we call it acid reflux. Mm. Down there, we might call it gastritis, Crohn's, irritable bowel syndrome, irritable bowel disease, celiac disease. We name them kind of based on where they are in the bowels, in the gut, somewhere between your mouth and your anus. If it's all the way down at the other end, we might call it hemorrhoids. (laughs) Right, But it's an inflammatory bowel condition, and we'll also name it based on whether we think it's autoimmune or what it is. Tell us about leaky gut, inflammatory bowels, and the symptoms that people are having because of that. Well, I think the first thing people need to assess is normal bowel function. And what I have learned is everybody thinks they have normal bowel function because nobody compares. And by the time it's abnormal, it's usually really severe. So I consider a normal bowel function as one to two easily passed bowel movements that are not loose and they sink. Okay. And so if you're having one bowel movement a week, that's a problem. If you're having 10 a day, that's a problem as well, because you're just not able to properly utilize the nutrients that are coming in. Or with the constipation, you're actually recirculating toxins or holding on to toxins because your body is trying to get those out. 
And often what I find is with constipation, it is because the muscles of the bowel aren't functioning. It's one of the reasons is the muscles aren't functioning well. They often don't have enough of the minerals to have peristalsis and contraction. So we try to fix that. They also often don't have the basic food, fiber, chemicals to actually support the bowel. That being said, then you talk about leaky gut. What is What the heck's leaky gut? Well, usually our body has very tiny gates that allows these digested particles through the cellular matrix, the gates, into the bloodstream. And usually those gates are very tight because it's a big risk to allow something in that's toxic, okay? And then the immune system is always on patrol. I call it the SWAT team. It's always on patrol trying to make sure that what does get into the bloodstream is not pathogenic. So if you have undigested chunks, big chunks of protein or polysaccharides or these other things that should not usually get in, the immune system rightly recognizes it as a foreign invader and starts to attack, okay? Now, why would the body open up those gates? Why would they be leaky? Um, often in times of stress, the body goes, okay, we need more fuel. We're going to let things in and risk getting that fuel in and risk being less discerning as to making sure we keep bad things out. So times of stress is probably, to me, one of the biggest drivers of leaky gut. And we come out of the womb stressed, right? And then we have micronutrient deficiencies. So the system is stressed. And then we have toxic food burden. The system is stressed. And you have antibiotics that are directly stressing that barrier function, okay? So once those gates open up and instead of being really tight, they're big, the big chunks that weren't necessarily broken down by the acid or weren't chewed well enough or didn't get the right transfixed, they get into the bloodstream. And again, the immune sees this sequence of proteins as a threat. And instead of, as it attacks that threat, what happens is often that sequence of protein is elsewhere in the body. So I say I, my pharmacy is at 130 South Main. Instead of seeing a one and a three and a zero, it's going to see 130 and it's going to attack 130. But what about the 130 south thyroid or the 130 south joint or the 130 south DNA? Well, these are the foundations of our autoimmune inflammatory process that is epidemic right now. And I think the source going back and backing this up is really paying attention to that gut, helping the gates close a little bit, helping us digest better, like you said, with the aloe vera and the enzyme, uh, and taking time. I mean, if you go through a drive through you've got the food before you pull out halfway down your gut. <laughs> the gut doesn't have time to start really chemically processing that food you into mean, the small chunks. I'm sorry, you mean the food-like substances. Yes, the food-like substances. <laughs> but even if it is a food, because of the pace, it can even be aggravating to these, these open-up gates. Um, so they're, they're, it's multifactorial, and it's all being caused by the culture, right. right? So to me, the culture is where we have to address... And we can do it on a macro scale. And I hope with this conversation, people are looking at that. I speak to my senator. I do all this stuff on a macro. But ultimately, where I think change is, is in the household with the individual crafting that new culture that can produce a different physiological outcome. And to be honest, mamas are really good about cleaning up cultures. So I often talk to mothers about how do we craft this environment for yourself and for your children and your husband so that we have a healthy outcome. So crafting that culture so these things aren't just being repeated is, I think, how we intervene. Yeah. 
That's really interesting the way you put the autoimmune condition, kind of that antibody lock and key, mm -hmm. but for the 130 and the 130 soft thyroid and the 130 soft autoimmune conditions, whatever it is, whatever part of your body is being affected, whether it's your cartilage, your joints, your any your brain, your, your brain, brain, yeah, your, your mood affecting your mood, whatever it's affecting, but there's all these conditions, all of these chronic fatigue and pain syndromes that we barely understand, but it could just be your immune system going haywire, attacking things it ought not, but it has to do something to get rid of the stuff that doesn't belong there because it yeah. passed through. As it makes yeah. all these antibodies, it's attacking everything. That looks like what I'm made for. Let me get rid of that. And we yeah, end up it's attacking one, ourselves. It's one of my frustrations with the current medical system. I have patients that have been on a thyroid supplement for decades, but doctors have never checked to see if it's an autoimmune thyroid problem. I actually had one honestly say, well, it doesn't change what we do, so we don't check it. And I'm like, well, you should, because if they have that process going on, the research said they're going to have three to five other autoimmunes in their lifetime. And it's because we've got to start looking at not just the diagnosis and the pill that they assign to it. We've got to really look, why is this happening? And I think if we start looking at like obesity is a symptom and it's an appropriate symptom, autoimmunity is a symptom and it's an appropriate symptom. If we can approach it from that way, one, we can acknowledge our magnificent, miraculous body, and we might be able to fix what it's a symptom of and what is the causative from it. That just makes so much more sense to me. And so I always encourage my patients that are on any thyroid, they've been diagnosed that they've got to get antibody measurements to see if this is part of the process for their unique condition. And maybe we can head off MS. Maybe we can head off that cancer if we can address this early on. Interesting. Yeah. MS where it's actually uh, attacking the myelin sheaths. Yes. Yes. 130 South Myelin. Yep. Exactly. Hmm. Well, Dr. Kathy Campbell, one of my favorite questions to ask is what is your favorite testimonial related to what you do? Well, I've, I've got several. <laughs> I've been doing this for 32 years, but I'll give you one that pops in my mind just recently. So I was at my pharmacy counter and I was ringing somebody up for a vitamin, actually. And he says, Kathy, do you recognize me? And I kind of said, well, kind of. But I've been doing this 32 years and People's faces are getting, sometimes I don't remember them as well as I should or could. And he said, well, I did your program and I'm down 115 pounds. And I was like, I usually remember all the people that do my weight loss coaching, which is a 12 week process. And when he told me his name, I'm like, oh, you did it in the middle of COVID with a mask on and you were 115 pounds heavier, right? And so I remember that he was really afraid of COVID and being obese. And so he was taking action to get coaching. And he did my 12 week program and I did not see him again. But he got the basics of navigating his life and he kept doing it. So for me, my goal is to help people navigate life and figure out their unique machine such that they can navigate their life in such a way that health shows up. And when he said that, I felt I was so excited. And I, I just think about that. Can we navigate life being well? And I think that's my goal for that at any stage. But that 115 pounds is just an overt number sign to reflect that the symptoms of his obesity have been altered and are being managed by him. Because I'm not seeing him. I haven't seen him in two and a half years, but he's managing it. And that's what I'm most excited about 
because what I know doesn't matter about an individual. It really is what you know about your unique machine and can adjust along the way that will have you have health. And so it really is an empowerment point of view and an education point of view. So that was very validating and I hope he has a rock in life and I'll probably see him in a year or something, which is great. Now, was there any medicine involved in his program, such as appetite suppression? No, not at all. No, I'm working to get the foundations right and to teach people to do that. And it's really amazing when you get the foundational health, when you give the body the basics that it needs, what the body can do. It's miraculous. Well, I really appreciate the time you spent with us today and... I want to encourage people to get a copy of your book. Where's the best place to get one? Well, you can either contact me at drkathysays.com. That's my website or Amazon. It is available on Amazon. And if you like it, please do a review. That's part of that game. So there's a couple different places you can find me. Feel free to reach out though. Yeah, I think it's excellent. I'll definitely give you a review. I'll make that happen as soon as we hang up here. I'll Thank put you. links to pick up those things below the video on YouTube at the bottom of the podcast page. If you're listening on iTunes, the link will be there. You'll have to copy and paste. They don't let you click through. One of the sad things. But I'll make sure all the links to your content and make it easy for people to find you. Tell us a little bit more about the program. Who can get on one of your weight loss programs? Well, it's an individualized coaching and I do it. I coached all over the United States. And what's unique to me is I do assess the medications and how they're playing into this. Seven out of 10 Americans are currently on a medication and they are designed to alter metabolic function. And again, we don't pull people off of them, but we do try to have their body not need them by the end of the 12 weeks. And then we coach the doctors and integrate with the doctors on possibly adjusting those down. So anybody, anybody who is interested in navigating and learning to navigate their own unique system, that's what this system is about. That's beautiful. Well, thank you and hope to do this again sometime. I know I'm gonna kind of pick your brain on some other, especially when I finish reading the book, I'm about halfway through. Uh, mm -hmm. So, all right, thank Give you. Give me so a call much. anytime. Thank you for what you do as well. I hope you enjoyed that episode today on the Dr. Haley Show. Make sure to hit subscribe on whichever platform you are listening to this. If this episode made you think of someone, go ahead, take a screenshot, and share this exact episode with them. You can catch the show notes for this episode on www.drhaley.com. If you want to geek out with Dr. Michael Haley on other radical health topics, be sure to check out his YouTube channel, where he posts exclusive video content. All the details are at www.drhaley.com and we can't wait to hang out with you on the next episode.